Yeah. The 9th Army, 29th Regiment, Battalion, Platoon, Squad, Normandy, France, Best Breath. My name is uh, Frank Cirillo from Gloresville, New York. And I was uh, drafted in the Army in 1943. Uh, well, at that time, uh, we were, uh, for, well, first of all, we, were, we, we had our basic training in uh, Camp Blaney, Florida. And then um, I, I decided to go in the Army, of course. And then uh, when we got overseas, I was uh, put in the 29th Infantry. Okay. And, and uh, uh, I was on a ship in Swansea, Wales with about 2,000 other soldiers. Uh, we, we are the overall strength of the 29th Infantry. And uh, when D-Day started, we were on this ship. And um, after a couple of days, we went into the channel. And believe me, there was a, you couldn't even see the water. There were so many ships. And anyway, we went in through. We got uh, landed on uh, D plus 4. What, what beach? Did and you uh, Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach. And uh, uh, on our arrival, we were welcomed with a few sniper shots, which stirs us up a little bit. And then um, from there, we waited a, a short while. Oh, well, let, me, let me mention this too. It was so sad because one of the soldiers uh, was struggling to, to make it in. They, they let us out a, a little bit. Uh, too far away from the coast, and uh, he, I saw him drown, and that was sad to see him go down. And uh, it's sad when I think about it. So anyway, so after that, we uh, while we were on the beach, we stayed a short while, and then we went up uh, up on top of the cliff. We had to go up about a 15-foot buff, and um, we stayed uh, that night on on the on the uh, edge of the uh, cliff, and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, the, uh, the flares and the light, it was like, it was, uh, believe it, it was like 4th of July, all kinds of flares, lights, sounds, and of course, all unfamiliar to us, you know, which in time I'll tell you how valuable it was to know about sounds, and, uh, and then uh, we wound up staying there for the, for the night. Oh, by the way, I want to mention, though, when, when we landed in Nazi, we had full field packs. They, they loaded us up, but we threw it all away and kept just our poncho and our blanket. We didn't, we, it was too much to carry. And we kept, of course, uh, some of the ration they had given us. So, and then um, the, uh, the next day, we, you want me to? Yeah. The next, uh, the, ne the next the next day. For a second. Yeah. So uh, the, the next day, uh, we left uh, the coast, and uh, we were uh, marching towards uh, Iceni, which uh, uh, <coughs> and we were marching. There was kind of a, a road where it had a whole line of trees on each side, and as we were marching through, we got strafed by our own planes. We yeah, couldn't yeah. believe it. Did you lose any? When no, we, we we hit the ground because the uh, the road was. Uh, wide enough, and there was a line of trees on both sides. We're, we're lucky nobody nobody got hit. We hit the ground and just lay there. But I guess evidently, whoever was the pilot in that plane uh, suddenly realized it was uh, American soldiers. So that was the first scare. <laughs> mm -hmm. So and then we continued on until we got into Iceni. So Iceni Iceni was already uh, uh, taken, uh, but uh, still there's skirmishes and there's there's uh, snipers around. But in Iceni, uh, as I went, entered the town, uh, there was a, a huge house on the, on the edge of town. And uh, I, I looked over, and I see there was a soldier pinned down by a sniper. So I, I, uh, I knew he couldn't make it. Look to me, I, I, the way he was moving, he was trying to move, but I think he was, he was wounded at the time, I thought. So I, 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 uh, I crawled along the side of the building. And because uh, the sniper wouldn't see me, and then I I told him to crawl a little bit so I can get his hand. 
So I finally did pull him over where he didn't, he didn't get shot anymore or anything. I brought we, I brought him back out in front of the the building, and, and I helped him out a little bit. And I told him, I said, "Look, you stay here. I says I'll get I'll send you a medic." And so that that's what I did. And I, then I went on and we went on through through Iceni. And now um, that, like I say, was uh, already taken, but the. Uh, I can't help. I got to mention that uh, some of the horrible sights that that I'm going to mention is unbelievable. What you see in a war, it's sad. So I I I feel bad about this war going on now. But anyway, so then from there, <coughs> my city naturally we were on on the way to St. Lo, mm -hmm. and that was hedgerow to hedgerow. Tell tell a little bit about the hedgerows. Yeah, right? the hedgerows. The hedgerows. In fact, I have a picture here. You can see. Let's see if I get it up right. Gives you an idea of the hedgerow. See. So, anyway. So we went, of course, like I say, we fight hedgerow to hedgerow. At one point, as we were going towards St. Lo, uh, we, we, I, I was with um. Oh, I was a right. Let me mention this too. I forget because I was a rifleman at that time, and, um, and we're heading heading uh, towards St. Lo. And naturally, that was uh, it's it's so close. Your enemy could be just one hedgerow away, and your and your uh, your command post, like uh, uh, like the Patan headquarters or regimental headquarters, could be two hedgerows back. It isn't like in an open field where, where it could be back maybe a half a mile or a mile. At times that happens, but most of the time, everything was close, very close. So <clears throat> as we went on uh, from there, the main uh, objective, of course, was St. Lo. And uh, we finally did get there and, and then captured the, you know, St. Lo, which was leveled to the ground when we got there, I'll tell you, terrible. Now the other another thing is that on the other way to St. Lo, at, at one particular point, um, I was at by that time I switched and I was with a, a BAR team, which was a Browning Automatic, and uh, I was put there. I carried the ammunition. <laughs> the other guy was the guy that shot. So uh, uh, while we were on the hedge, we were getting uh, shot at with uh, sniper fire. So we had to keep keep low. And uh, to the left, to the left of us, there was a uh, sort of a bombed-out opening. And um, and a short while after, <clears throat> all of a sudden, I see this lieutenant coming up. He was all dressed up, and, and he had a shiny bar on his sh shoulder, which which sh sh shocked me because they're they're not they don't wear bars. They they sew them on. They sew the straps and, or whatever the stripes. And uh, I, it makes me sad to think about it because he walks up in plain view. He, there was a cutout there, like I say, maybe th three yards wide. And he puts his field glasses up to see, and he got shot right in the right eye. Died instantly. What, what it's, it's, it's sad to say, but it was a stupid mistake. You know, you just don't go in an open area and just stand up and say, here I am. I, I, I felt oh, bad. I said, this guy, he, he just was bound to die. That's all there was to it. That was, that was an experience in itself. Then as we went on to, to St. Lo also more, um, we've got to mention this too, because uh, we were, we were uh, and of course, I'm back on the hedgerow. <coughs> and um, let me, let me uh, collect my thoughts a second. And um, oh, okay. Hold it, Frank. I gotta. I, I gotta. Uh, also, while we're on the way to St. Lo, <coughs> um, we were uh, supposed to be crossing a road. We're on the hedge, and there's an opening there, and we're supposed to go across this road. Now the first. The first fellow that ran through, he came right back 
almost instantly, and he had his right hand shot off. So naturally, I told him, well, just not too far, just keep going straight back. And the, the medic, there's a medic there, don't worry about it. So now, the next, the next person who was going through was an officer. But he, he, he refused to go. I waited, I was next. So I waited and I waited, and, you know, it's demor demoralizing if, you're, if you see your, if one of your officers like that, lieutenant refuses to, that's not good for an enlisted man, you know, the regular, and he refused, so they had to come and take him away. And there's more to that story later on. And uh, <clears throat> they did take him, him away, and, and at that point, uh, I was supposed to go, but... Uh, the, uh, Lieutenant Tibbetts, he, he, he told me to let it go, not to go through. So that was another incident. And then uh, along the way, um, we uh, went on a few more hedges, you know, it was hedger, hedgerow after hedgerow. Uh, I had a, I got a couple, of, I caught a couple of prisoners uh, that, uh, and uh, I had to take them back, you know, the back of the line. But uh, I, I didn't have time. I had to go see my uh, command commander. It was very important, my captain. And so I called this uh, other soldier over, short, stocky guy. I said, do me a favor. I said, take these back because i got to go to the CP and see the captain. And he says, OK. So to make a long story short, the next day when I went, I had to go back on a, on a routine from company to battalion headquarters. I found both of those Germans shot in the head. He never, he never took him back. He, he took him back and he just shot him. That was sad. I mean, I know war is war. You know, you're bitter. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. But anyway, that's what he did. He shot both of them and they laid there on the ground. So um, that, that's another story. I'm going to hesitate in there, Frank. Okay, now now you, uh, we're, we're through the hedgerows and we and uh, we're, we went into to Saint Lo, and that was uh, uh, that was the uh, biggest offensive move to get into Saint Lo. In fact, one lieutenant from uh, uh, another uh, another company he, he he promised his men he was going to lead them in and and he did lead them in, but they shot him right at the right at the beginning of the St. Lo, which was a sad story. That's why I mentioned it, mm. you know. All right, now, the other thing in uh, St. Lo, or, or out of St. after St. Lo, a ways, a ways up. And I can't always remember exact spots, but um, <clears throat> we had a, a counterattack by the Germans. Now, the, the thing of it is, we were moving up ourselves. And the Second Army Division were there, uh, and, which I didn't know until we got to that point. And uh, anyway, the Germans uh, started the uh, barrage with uh, their 88s for about, oh, it, was, oh, it was unbelievable, it, maybe 10 minutes or so at last, 10, 15 minutes. In the meantime, uh, I had already taken care of my friend that got wounded, and uh, I jumped in the, I, I didn't have a foxhole right away. And so I jumped in the foxhole with uh, two of the guys that were uh, tank, that uh, uh, drove the tanks, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, waited until after everything settled down. In fact, I got to mention, because they asked me, he said, why don't you come on along with us? I said, no, you keep your tank. I said, <laughs> I'm not interested. So what I did, I went back. Uh, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't find uh, everything. With, uh, that barrage just separated everything. So I, I said to myself, well, I better go back and look for either Patan headquarters or, or regimental headquarters. Which, anyway, I wound up uh, getting the regimental headquarters. And, I, and I, I, of course, I went in and I saluted the colonel, told him who I was, and I said, I'm displaced from my company. So he sent me to the, to the kitchen, about 15 miles back of the line. And uh, I spent two weeks there on KP. <laughs> I have to laugh because... <laughs> I, I was surprised he even kept me that long. So anyway, then after that, of course, I, I was sent back to my unit, see. 
and then from there, and then from there we were uh, we went uh, up to the Brest Peninsula, as, you know, on the coast of uh, France, and uh, it was pretty well cleared out because uh, uh, the other regiments, uh, one one other regiment, I think it was the 115th regiment, uh, was in, got in at first, and uh, we went in more or less like a map up. Uh, you know, company, and uh, we stayed there a short while. Oh, I don't, I don't know, maybe about four or five days. You know, and because that's where they had, you know, had all the U-boats and like that. So anyway, so now we're uh, we're um, boarding the, uh, a train. They took us to a train by truck. They took us to a train, and to, uh, to go from there to Aachen, Germany. Now. What I got to tell you is, too, is the fellow that refused, the captain, uh, the lieutenant that refused, he was one of the, uh, car uh, what do you want to call him, he, on, on, the, on the train, he, he was in charge of one of the cars. So they, in other words, I was surprised to see him, but uh, I didn't say nothing to him. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because uh, it, it can happen to anybody. There's other guys that had to run back. Uh, not a lot, but they go back a hedgerow or something, but they come back, you know. So, and, uh, so anyway, then from there, like I say, we went to Aachen, Germany. And, and there we sort of regrouped. There was lots of, lot of, lot of change in there. I saw other, uh, you know, a lot of trucks and a lot of, a lot of us uh, soldiers. And, uh, and Aachen, Germany, we only stayed there a short while in Aachen, Germany. And then we, then we went on and started to go uh, through s several towns in Germany, like, uh, like Aldenhove and Kozla, and, and, and we took all these towns as we went along. And, and, then, um, and, and then we wound the, uh, and then we come to a town, uh, really a big city, called Munchen Gleibach. That was the largest city taken at that point. And, th and for us it was interesting because uh, we were allowed to stay there about uh, pretty much about a week. We stayed in that area, and uh, and while there, I saw the first U V2 rocket go uh, across the, in the sky. Uh, and I know it was headed for England, and also saw a German and um, uh, American uh, dogfight airplanes up, up there uh, for about they they went they went at it for about 15 20 minutes, and finally. The German took off. He ended it right there, you know. So that that was uh, interesting, you know, to, to see that, you know. Uh, let's see now. Then um, there was something else there, but I can't quite remember. It, but okay, let's hold a minute, Frank. Yeah. And now uh, I think we were at Aachen, right, at the time. Well, we left Aachen. We went on to several German towns, Munich, and Gladbach, and and we kept going on until we got to a place called Kirchberg. And Kirchberg was on, it was on the, um, know, it's on a hill like, and it overlooked the Ruhr River. And, and this is where I spent uh, Christmas of 1944 on guard. And, uh, and um, we stayed there, uh, we stayed there quite, while the, while the Battle of the Balls was going on, we were, we were in this particular area. Holding ground, more or less. So we actually, you were in Germany. Well, in Germany now. This is in Germany, right? And um, we, like I say, we stayed there several, a few weeks, and then af after that we uh, regrouped and we went uh, in another area, which was also on, you know, on the banks of the Ruhr River, more, more where we can see this uh, city of Ulick, Ulick. And uh, we we train there for two weeks. That's, that's one thing you do all the time, you know. When you got you don't get no rest, you you train. So, and while there, uh, uh, the, uh, the welcome wagon comes up, you know that, uh, and that's where we uh, uh, met uh, Diana Shore, and uh, I, I went up to speak to her. And in the meantime, uh, I. I went up to uh, to speak to her and um, and uh, I said, uh, "Gee, you got uh, you got nice boots there," 
Yeah, brand new, aren't they? He says, yeah. I said, take a look at mine. I said, I showed him my suit. I had holes. I had, they were cut. And I was, wait, I, I was waiting two weeks to get a pair of shoes. I couldn't believe it. I mentioned to her, the next day I got the shoes. Can you believe it? <laughs> That's the truth. But she was very nice. She was nice, very nice. Now, at, now, while we're there on the banks of the Ruhr, uh, we get uh, uh, General Eisenhower, General Omaha Brett. Okay, at the present time now, we're on the Ruhr River, near the Ruhr River, let's put it that way. And while we were there, it was, we were there two, at least two weeks, we were training to cross the Ruhr into Ulik. Uh, and, uh, in between, of course, uh, the welcome wagon come in where they give you coffee and donuts. And Diana Shore was one of the people there, and I thought that was neat, you know. So I went over to uh, say hi to her, and uh, she had uh, brand new uh, combat boots. And I, I said to her, I said, gee, I said, that's pretty nice. I said, take a look at mine. And mine was all, all cut up on the side. I needed new shoes. I've been waiting two weeks to get them. And now, uh, finally, uh, after talking to her, her, her a while, uh, uh, the next day, I should say, that I got the new shoes. She must have, you know, told them. Now, in the same, this is uh, in the same place now, in the Roar, uh, we got a visit from Eisenhower, Omaha Bradley, General, uh, General uh, Simpson of the Ninth Army, um, Gerhard, General Gerhard, our division commander, and let's see, yeah, that was and they came. Uh, it was sort of like a sunken area, and they, and they come, and I was kind of surprised, you know. And uh, Eisenhower uh, gave, gave it sort of a prep talk. And he says, listen, you fellas are doing a great job. We're going to get this job done quick. You get across this river and go on, and you're going to go home. He gave a very nice talk. He was very, very nice. And Omar Bradley, he said something. I can't remember every, everything they said, but it, it was nice to see him. But the, they were well guarded. It, it was a wooded area in the back of them. See? So that was kind of nice. It kind of uh, you know, lift your spirits up. Uh, that, you know, that, gee, you really hurry out of the Supreme Commander coming up to give you encouragement. I, you know, I thought that was pretty neat, you know. Uh, now let's, uh, now anyway, all right, next was uh, uh, to cross the Ruhr River. Like I say, it took, took a couple of weeks, and uh, and uh, I do have photo, photos of that. Uh, maybe I should have had that. I'll kind of hold it up. Uh, if you see uh, this here, that's me walking across the bridge, and the fellow in front of me, of course, he got shot. He was, he'd been there a while, and going across the pontoon bridge that was put across. And when we got on the other side. I should have had that out here. Hold up, Frank. I'm gonna, where did I put it? Yeah. Oh. Oh, why don't we? All right. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, when we got under, or anyway, when we got across the river, the Ruhr River, you like we. Uh, the first thing we had to do was hit the hit the ground because we got uh, sniper fire coming at us. So it kept us down for a while until, uh, no, just a short while, not 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 too long in in, uh, in the Ulick. So now, uh, let's see, after after Ulick, um, put a hole, Frank. After after crossing the, the Ruhr River, uh, we were pinned down. Uh, for a, for a little while there, and then uh, finally uh, uh, the sniper, whoever it was, he took off by then, you know. And uh, hold Frank. 
Damn it. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we've been through that. We, we've area. been through that already? I mean, you're, here, the part of the atrocity, though? No. We didn't do that. No. Okay, okay. Then uh, let's see. And we should go to, let's see, the Cross the Roar. And of course, that was really seen before, but we can mention it, mention it now. Okay, Frank. I have to read Cross the Roar River to Ulick. And, and then we went on, and, and in short ways, we didn't go a, a long distance, where, where we took a, a sort of a, a rest area, we took a break, in other words. And from the from the from from the action, and then while we were taking that break, uh, we were uh, tro the troops were put on uh, two three trucks, and they drove us to a short not too far a short ways to see uh, some of the atrocities that that took place. Now when we got there, there was this huge barn. It was just a farm area. This huge barn. And, uh, and inside the barn, uh, what they did, they put the c civilians, the Germans put the civilians in the barn and then saturated the front of it with hay and burned it. They burned them alive, I swear. And then outside, the whole length of that, I would say about 30 feet at least, they had a trench dug where they threw all of these all nude civilian bodies. If you saw this, make you sick. And uh, they, they threw all those bodies in, and, then, and uh, we didn't stay to see it, but then uh, they covered them up. And this was German atrocities, which is a very sad story. So then after that, of course, uh, we went back to our rest where we were staying, and then uh, then we started to go through several towns, through the, through several uh, of the German towns, uh, Koslar, uh, Searsdorf, Aldenhoven, uh, all these different uh, towns. And uh, it was easy picking them. I mean, the Germans were running real fast by then. And then when we got to the end of that, we were up uh, a distance from the Elbe River. Now, the Elbe River, um, I was sent out uh, to um, check. There was a sort of a, like a knoll, an incline, like that. And uh, I, the, my uh, captain, of course, I'm taking orders, you know, you realize that. Uh, he, he told me to go up along and oversee, what, see what you can see. So I did. I crawled up along the hedge quite a ways up. And uh, I looked over, of course, where they see the Elbe River. And I see across the river thousands of people, thousands. I, I didn't know, couldn't make it out what it was yet. So then I, I went back to my uh, company commander, and, and General Gerhardt was there. And he, he, my, my company commander said, take the general up and show him what you saw. So he did. He come, he, I, of course, went first, we crawled along the hedge and got in a position where he could oversee the Elbe River and like that. And, uh, and then after that, I went back. And then, in, well, maybe, I think they, we, we all regrouped and like that. And uh, then uh, we all, we started, all the troops started to move up, like you would in, in, in an offensive move. Because in the meantime, there was another action going in a wooded area. That's another story. But uh, we, we went on through, right on through to the Elbe River. And when we got there, there was oh, gee, about hundreds, hundreds of, of Germans that had surrendered. I mean, I'm talking about maybe five, six hundred or more. more. They, they had surrendered, and they were all waiting there on the bank. And to the, to the, to the right of that, uh, the, there was a Russian uh, command post. But they were about oh, maybe half a mile away. So now the next thing we had to do, was the, uh, General Gerhardt, so he, General Gerhardt and uh, one officer, 
myself and one other fella. We got in this a, a, a boat, and r we rowed across. <laughs> it wasn't even the motor. <laughs> it wasn't that. I, I would say from here to the telephone company. It wasn't you know that that wide. And we got over there, and uh, the Germans had a had a tent where their commanders were, and so. Uh, Johnny Gerhardt uh, went there and they come out and I hadn't moved to the left and I imagine the, the two of us there were on guard, we were on guard. It was, I got to say, it was scary. It was scary because you don't know what could happen, you know. And uh, anyway, they surrendered to General Gerhardt, official surrender. And because they, those people were all V2 workers. That's what I understand. Then we come back after that. And then there was a, there was a, 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 an incident I, I might mention. Uh, I told you about uh, the, this other action that was going uh, on, on the left flank of us. Well, anyway, the, there was a, a sergeant there. Uh, he got a silver star for bravery, in fact, in this particular action. And uh, him and myself had to go. There was a, uh, well, let me mention here. There was a sniper firing at us. So myself and this sergeant was selected to go and, and weed this guy out of that house. There was a house a certain distance away, which we did. We got around there and... Uh, we finally got him and he gave up. But now the sergeant, he, wa he, wanted, he wanted to shoot him. You know, I mean, he was already captured. But I, I got to tell you the truth. I, I said, you can't do that. I said, he's a, the, the Geneva Convention said you don't shoot. If he's captured, you don't shoot him. I had to talk him into it. I really did talk him into not to shoot the guy. So then, we, of course, we went back. And uh, when we got back to the, where all where our troops were and all those prisoners were, uh, the fellow that was uh, wanted to shoot him, he brought him back to there and he gave him one with the butt of his rifle, knocked him in the head. I said, he was he he was going to get something out of it, but uh, that's that's where that's where the war ended and and amen is what I say when I got to that point. general thought about your experiences during the war, uh, any impression that overrides the others? Yes. I am so proud. I, 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 I could cry, you know, I, I, you get sensitive. Of our officers, they, uh, they were s wonderful. These, these officers they, 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 not only bravery, but taking control and running that company, you know, under all the conditions. Uh, and I had uh, one, our lieutenant, Lieutenant Tibbetts, he was such a morale builder. You, the, the old saying is, you follow the leader. You've got good leaders, you're going to have good troops. And these off, these off, I'm telling you, they were all fantastic. I mean, and they were, you know, that that gives you encouragement, you know, you, you keep you going. But I mean, even our commanding officer is, he was just a wonderful man. And General Gerhardt, General Cornell, there were several. Even when I went back, when I used to take messages, I don't know, did I mention about being the runner in the mess? wanted to get to that, yes. Yeah, so you, yeah, you uh, that. yeah I, well, I, I should have mentioned this before, because uh, originally I started out a, as a, a, a rifleman. I, I, I was that way for about a month. And then uh, uh, one of the runners uh, got uh, killed, so I volunteered to take the job and uh, to become a messenger and a runner. Which I, which I felt more comfortable with. Because then I would be in contact with the captain and the captain would send me 
to battalion or to regimental headquarters for messages or uh, for material or for for uh, the wiremen at that time you need the wire wiremen and medics and like that and that that was my my duty all the way through I become a a messenger in that respect. Sometimes it was dangerous, very dangerous, because I had to go out at night sometimes. I remember one particular time, I got that, this is the only thing that I remember about that, but uh, it was night and I had to go ahead and, and, and check the position on the left flank. My, I know my commanding officer was on the right flank, so I went down and it was sort of a, like a deep gully, and I went up and I, I was going to look over the top, and I was out of nowhere. I did not know where the heck I was. So I didn't dare go over the top of that knoll. I, I don't know what I was going to land to. So I, I, just, I just went back. And uh, then I swung around and reported to my command, company commander what I did and like that. This is fine. And uh, that was the last uh, uh, battle experience, I'd say. I don't know, I wanted to state, wait, I don't know if I, did I uh, mention at all about the BAR team? The you Browning, began to get into it a little bit. The Browning Automatic. You mentioned it just very briefly, why don't you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, it's uh, uh, something that I, I didn't want to overlook because at the time uh, I, I was, uh, was uh, just, I guess it was just a fill-in. I, I really wasn't with the, you know, the Browning Automatic. And, and so I, I went along and I went, uh, I carried the ammunition for him. And we were along the hedgerow. And there was a sniper again, you know. There's always snipers. No matter where you go, there were snipers. And he kept our heads down. Now to the left of us, there was a, a, a sort of a bombed out se section. And uh, so we're just holding ground there. And then all of a sudden, uh, I see this lieutenant coming up. He was all dressed up in his uh, uniform. I could tell he was a, a greenhorn. I knew he was. And he had uh, uh, his uh, cap captain's patch on him. Instead of having a sewn on, which he should have done, he had his regular patch. It shined like, it was crazy. So he come up with, with that shiny bar and he got in the, in the middle of that bombed out section and uh, it's sad. The guy shot him right in the right eye and he just went down, that was it. He was done. What, how, what got me at this, how he, I couldn't yell, I only felt bad because it was so quick, I didn't even have a chance to say, lay low. I just didn't have a chance. He got his knee down there and boom, he was shot and he was gone. So that, I wanted to mention that. That was uh, too bad that that happened. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned also, did I mention also about um, uh, the two prisoners I turned over to? I don't know. At one point, I think I might have mentioned yeah, I that. Yeah. yeah. I, and I think I mentioned... Um, about the uh, lieutenant on the train. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, it's fine. Uh, I think uh, uh, we've covered uh, the war as far as I can remember. There's probably other things, probably, but uh, it's hard to keep all that information in your head. <laughs> but I do appreciate you to do something like this and uh, bring it out to the public. Let them see what what really happens. You know. A lot of soldiers are not interested in trying to tell. I don't criticize them. That's all right. But my feelings are there's everything I tell and what they learn, these young people, and the other, they're going to learn. They're going to be educated by it. In fact, I have uh, a whole, whole report that I sent to Tom Brokoff and filed in, uh, in the, um, his uh, file. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, what I sent him in time will be used in Florida State University that, uh, when they're studying about World War II. Th they got 3,000, uh, um, what do you want to call them, uh, packages of, uh, of war experiences that the college can use for education. 
the, the Florida State University uh, concerning World War II. This is a map and, and picture of uh, World War II for the, on the 29th Division from the beginning to end. This is a newsletter that we get received every week uh, it's telling us what uh, has been going on in, in, as our movement to the, when we were up front. This is a picture of the hedgerows that we uh, used for protection while fighting the enemy. This is a picture of St. Lowe. I'm moving in now, looking for any, any scattered snipers uh, <coughs> in the area of St. Lowe. This is a picture of me crossing the pontoon bridge from the uh, Roar River side to, to Uli. of one of the towns in Germany called Bunty. They manufactured cigars here and it was a very neat and clean city and I guess that's why I collected this card. Of myself and a, a young boy that was my helper uh, as we, uh, we had a writing academy in uh, in uh, Hagen, Germany. That's too small to show. Why don't you show the newspaper? Okay? Yeah, That's sure. All right, just a second now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. This is a newspaper, The Stars and Stripes. We get occasionally, it would give us the news from home and also whatever is happening in our country. Now, this is the end. This is. This is the uh, uh, sort of a hi history pamphlet. Uh, it gives us the Ulick and Roar River and uh, the November, the offensives and so on. Now this is a collection of money that I re uh, got in France, Germany, Belgium, Holland. Just, uh, that's it. These are German medals that I collected. At the end of the war, or just my name is Frank Cirillo, I'm, uh, Gloversville, New York, and. Uh, what I've shown here today about the history of World War II. Um, didn't do that right. My name is Frank Cirillo. I live in Gloversville, New York. And what I've shown here today is all about the history of, of what I've experienced in World War II.